Greetings and welcome back. It's your boy Kamal once again and today we're taking a look at a very interesting case study in differential equations. We're looking for a function f such that its derivative equals the composition of the function with itself. Which does sound pretty cool, but how exactly do we approach this question? Well, because this sounds like such a novel question, we'll approach it in the same way as we would any differential equation on the first day of our differential equations class. That is, we'll take a guess at what kind of function could actually work here. So we have f prime equal to f of f of x. So whatever function we have on the left-hand side, we should have the same kind of function on the right-hand side. By that token, recall that the derivatives of power functions are power functions and a power function composed with another power function is another power function. So it makes sense for f of x to be of the form of alpha times x to the beta, where alpha and beta could be complex numbers. Okay, cool. So our task now would be to find what parameters alpha and beta would make our differential equation work. So first things first, we'll differentiate this to get f prime which gives us alpha times beta times x to the beta minus one. So that's one ingredient needed, and the other ingredient is the composition. So we need f of f of x, which is, well, f of f of x. And that means we have alpha times alpha times x to the beta all to the beta. Now expanding this gives us alpha times alpha to the beta times alpha to the beta squared, which equals alpha to the beta plus one, terribly sorry about that, much better, times x to the beta squared. So those are the two ingredients we needed for our differential equation. And these two are supposed to be equal, f prime and f of f. So that means we have the equation alpha times beta times x to the beta minus one equal to alpha to the beta plus one times x to the beta squared. And what this equation is telling us is that the coefficients are equal and so are the exponents of x. So first things first, we have alpha times beta equal to alpha to the beta plus one. And we'll expand this using one over alpha because of course alpha should not be zero, otherwise there's no fun in that. So this implies that we have beta equal to alpha to the beta plus one minus one, which is of course alpha to the beta. Or in other words, we have alpha equal to beta to the one by beta. So we have alpha in terms of beta, which means that all we need now is to find what exactly is beta? And that's not a difficult task whatsoever because equating the exponents gives us a quadratic equation in beta. That is beta squared equal to beta minus one, which implies that beta minus beta plus one equals zero, beta squared minus beta that is. So applying the quadratic formula gives us beta here equal to one plus or minus root one minus four, times one times one, so yeah, that's a f that's definitely a four. I once messed up the quadratic formula in a video. I think, yeah, that was, that was the video on Cleo's integral, divided by two. Okay, cool. So that means we have one plus or minus i times root three over two. So beta here equals one half plus i times root three over two, or it could be one half minus i root three over two. And it could be nicer to write this in the polar form. So what exactly is one half? I believe one half is the cosine of pi over three. Yeah, it's exactly that because that's the sine of pi over six. All right, I remember some basic math. So we have cosine of pi over three plus i times the sine of pi over three. Then we have the cosine of negative pi over three plus i times the sine of, wait, I just need a little bit of writing space. The sine of negative pi over three, where we've made use of the fact that the cosine function is an even function where the sine is an odd function. So this thing here is e to the i pi over three, 
and here we have e to the negative i pi over 3 so these are our two possible values for the beta parameter now for alpha recall that alpha here equaled beta to the 1 over beta so in case beta equals e to the i pi over 3 and 1 over beta would equal 1 over e to the i pi over 3 which is of course e to the negative i pi over 3 yielding for the first case we have alpha equal to e to the i pi over 3 raised to e to the negative i pi over 3 and I wonder if I should have just left these in the Cartesian form mm, nah, we have e's and we have pi's and we have i's I mean this thing is awesome this is definitely awesome so we have alpha here equal to e to the i pi over 3 times e to the negative i pi over 3 so that's the first case now what about the case of beta here equal to e to the negative i pi over 3 which means 1 over beta would be equal to e to the i pi over 3 and this yields alpha equal to e to the negative i pi over 3 raised to e to the i pi over 3 and this thing simplifies out to e to the negative i pi over 3 times e to the i pi over 3 plenty of e's and i's and pi's yeah this is this is looking good so far so now it's time to piece everything together in that we have f of x equal to alpha times x to the beta so that means the function could be for the first case that I'm going to call f sub 1 of x terribly sorry about that so f sub 1 of x could be first we need alpha so that would be e to the i pi over 3 wait let me just write this slightly nicer times e to the negative i pi over 3 times x to the beta and beta here was of course e to the i pi over 3 that is one exotic looking solution I cannot get enough of this and f sub 2 of x the other solution would be e to the negative i pi over 3 times e to the i pi over 3 times x times e to the negative i pi over 3 so these are two possible solutions to our differential equation you know what at this stage i am kind of curious about how the solutions would look if i just left beta and alpha in the cartesian form so let's just take a quick crack at that so beta here equaled one half plus i times root three over two and one over beta because we knew exactly what this thing looks like in the polar form we know that this thing would be one half minus i times root 3 over 2 so in this case we have because alpha equals beta to the 1 over beta I'm just going to skip straight to the solution for f sub 1 of x that would be alpha which is 1 over 2 terribly sorry about that 1 over 2 plus i times root 3 over 2 to the 1 half minus i times root 3 over 2 times x to the 1 half plus i times root 3 over 2 which does indeed look quite rootful and f sub 2 of x would be correspondingly 1 half minus i times root 3 over 2 to the 1 half plus i times root 3 over 2 times x to the one half minus i times root three over two and i'm kind of digging these results slightly more than even the form with the i's and pi's and e's i do like these forms for f sub one and f sub two now there is one thing to address here and that is because we have complex power functions involved that is we have functions of the form z to the alpha where z and alpha are both are both complex numbers this thing is a multi-valued function which of course isn't continuous so technically speaking our solution could be stated in terms of the principal branch so these are two possible solutions defined using the principal branch of the complex power functions involved and I don't think that there are other solutions to this differential equation unless you would count other branches of the power function but besides that, 
Attempts are welcome at figuring out further solutions to this case study, and you can mention them in the comment section. Yeah, that's a nice exercise. So yeah, I was just doing something along the margins, and then I was like, nah, there's not much space in there, even though this is a digital blackboard, so that's not exactly a very valid, valid excuse. But yeah, I was doing something that has finally led me to conclude that this would be a suitable exercise to the viewer. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.